Hi guys, it feels like almost a cold winter day here in the middle of April 2020 here in the great state of Texas uh, where we are in the police lockdown uh, here in Garfield, Texas here at Collapse Chronicles which although it, this might be the Corona Panic Chronicles a little bit of both today my name is Sam Mitchell and I will be your host for the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, but we're going to go all the way over to Finland today, which probably is warmer than Texas for all I know, where I have the great pleasure, and I hope I uh, get, this man, get this man's name right, we're going to be speaking with Panu Pikala. I hope I got that right, Panu. And, That's good. I, I, did pretty, I did pretty good. Okay, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear that. So I have mentioned, you guys might remember where I read a, uh, parts of an essay of Panu's a few months ago, but we're going to attempt to, to make Panu a, a household word down here in the Dunasphere. So um, for those of you not familiar with Panu, he is a professor of environmental theology in the Faculty of Theology at the University of Helsinki in Finland. His interdisciplinary research deals with the psychological and spiritual dimensions related to environmental issues and especially climate change. He has become known as an expert in eco anxiety. He is also affiliated with the Helsa Sustainability Science Center and he has published widely in um, talk, talking about eco-theology, eco-anxiety, and climate change anxiety, but of course we're going to be talking about the latest anxiety, some would say panic on the planet, and that is the coronavirus anxiety. So Panu, come on and say, Panu, come on and say hello to the folks, and we're going to dive right into this. Mm. Tervehdys kaikille. So hello everyone, that's the Finnish part of this interview. I'll be speaking English now on. Thanks for the invitation. Okay, so... As I was just speaking, with, you know, I've been, we've been talking for a few minutes before I got the microphone turned on. And obviously, guys, up until three weeks ago, you know, what I had been planning to talk about <clears throat> was about eco -anxi ecological anxiety and more specifically climate change anxiety about, you know, anxiety about things that you can't definitely see in front of you, you know, kind of long-term threats and, and that kind of stuff. And I'm hoping we're going later in the interview going to be talking about that. But right now, obviously, folks, we all know what the big story on the planet is. And uh, this is what I uh, refer to as Corona Panic. So we're going to start out at least start out, not sure how long we're going to stay here, over with the coronavirus. So, uh, Panu, just come on and, 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 like, all I can say is, wow. What, is, what do you think about the, the, the level of anxiety and or panic all over this planet right now and as we're having this conversation? Identify it for us, and then we're going to figure out what we can do about it. Mm. Yeah, like you said, it's all over and one doesn't have to be a especially sensitive person to sense the collective anxiety and even panic and dread that people are experiencing right now. Well, speaking from Finland, which is a quite special place, place in, the, in, in the world, five million people far up in the, in, in the, in the north, long history of dem democracy, we have our, our problems and, and some advantages all, also. And in, in places like Finland, uh, since the Second World War, we haven't had any, any crisis near to this 
corona crisis. And on one fundamental thing here is that this, this brings into the citizens of the industrialized nations some uh, first-hand knowledge that many, many people in more vulnerable communities and countries and places have felt, felt of course, for ages. So there's a certain, certain dem democratizing effect here. But uh, the similarities and differences between eco-anxiety and so-called corona-anxiety, they are quite, quite interesting. I, I think there's some profound similarities and some profound differences, I think. What are these, what, what, let's talk about these similarities, I think is what we mainly want to, want to focus on. Uh, how, is, how are you incorporating your work into responding to this uh, latest outbreak of anxiety? Yeah, the, uh, my work recently has dealt with this global threats uh, and pheno phenomenon which have all kinds of impacts including psychological impacts and uh, what I like to call with several others psychosocial impacts so it's not it's related to the human mind the psyche but also to the way in which we are social creatures so I think the combination of psychological and social is very crucial and that's why this a strand of psychosocial research is something that I also want to situate my, myself in. Uh, and you know, in the, in the 80s, for example, and during the Cold War, lots of people had what could, can be called nuclear anxiety. There's some writings on that, that also. And of course, some, some thinkers like Robert J. Lifton, Lifton is one of the thinkers that I'm uh, holding high, high esteem, uh, has explicitly and compared some elements of this nuclear anxiety with climate anxiety, for for example. So that was that was back back then. Uh, and then uh, there, there's been various kinds of ecological anxiety and climate climate an anxiety. And now the corona threat. It's also global. Uh, it has local manifestations. So it has these both sides. Uh, it's massive, but it's also affecting it, it, each person in a, in. In, in some some way, so that's a big similarity, and then it poses a real existential threat. Uh, now, this concept, the existential threat, is commonly used in two uh, definitions. One is related to the end of existence, simply so to, uh, that it can cause cause deaths plainly, but and the other one is related to existentialism, the sort of. Uh, ancient and deep questions related to human existing and that's the stuff of philosophers and psychologists and also some religious thinkers and that's been more more of my my field but but anyway a big similarity between eco anxiety and corona anxiety is that there's a threat uh, of, of of suffering and death and that's something that the citizens of industrialized nations really are not good at handling at the moment. Well, we're, that, that, that is certainly bearing out. Well, well the way I am viewing this, I, I, am, I am seeing two major uh, sources of anxiety and a third source uh, which we might get around to. But let, let's, let's tease these apart. Okay. The anxiety of actually catching, I, I want to look at the, the health effects, the biological health effects of the virus on, uh, on the human body. I, I, I want to start here with the most fundamental source of anxiety. A, of, of course, no one wants to get this. And B, uh, no one wants to to die from this. And what I have uh, th 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 this brings up the whole the whole can of worms uh, about death anxiety and, and all of this. Uh, how are you counseling, or how would you counsel people who are just completely beside themselves? 
a, a, about fears about catching the disease and or dying from it? How do you get people to calm down over this? Or can you get them to calm down? Mm. Yeah, that's a very crucial question. And, and let me start by say, saying that I don't consider myself to be a big enough guru to provide consolation for, for, for everyone in, in this re- regard. But uh, of course, this is something that I have been closely thinking about uh, now during the last month or so in relation to the corona crisis and before that in relation to other anxieties and mainly ego and anxiety. And one similarity in the psychological advice to people both who suffer from ego anxiety and those who suffer from corona anxiety is to limit the media exposure. So that's, that's something that one can start with. Uh, it's very easy to get into the flow of following all these very unusual news coming from all over the world. But that, that really makes the anxiety worse. So I'm not saying, you know, people should just stop following any news. That's not healthy either. But for example, many psychologists that I value recommend that one should send, spend uh, maximum 30 minutes a day uh, with, with the corona news coverage. And, and I reckon that's, that's much, uh, much low the average what, of what people are doing at the moment. Yeah, this, so that's the, a, yeah, this is a bombardment. I mean, 24-7 wall-to-wall coverage uh, of this with no other story, including climate change and other environment. I mean, environmental news has completely been thrown under the bus. Uh, I mean, it's... What, what's this all about with that? I mean, why do you think, I, I know you're not a, a, a media um, analyst, but just I'm just curious what you think that's all about. Why, why is the media uh, treating this story like this? Mm, yeah, I bet there are several, several reasons. A sort of clinical view would be that because it sells it's uh, it's so interesting for people and so unusual that then people want to follow it. But I also think that there's more complicated and partly tragic reasons for the journalists themselves. Of course, this is a very troubling issue, one that catches their attention. It's part of their job to follow the news all the time, and it's, for them, it's also very easy to get so get into the flow of, of constantly reporting about about things. And, and then, then, of course, we might discuss some very basics related to, to anxiety here. For example, the so-called phenomenon of catastrophizing. And yeah. uh, that, that when there's a lot of, lot of in, in, in input, um, it, it's all too easy uh, to get stu- stuck into, uh, into a sort of vicious circle where everything just feels like getting worse and worse. And this is a real, real problem also in relation to climate, climate anxiety, even though I have to say at this, this point already uh, that climate change and the ecological catastrophe are far worse threats than, than the corona threat. I don't want to be diminutive here or in, in any way, you know, lessen, lessen the miseries brought by the coronavirus, but the planetary scale threat of collapse that is um, podcast and YouTube channel is all about that is of course in the long run even even worse worse scenario but still it's no, no use for people with climate anxiety either to get stuck into that kind of catastrophizing where, where your uh, ability to do anything just lessens because you are stuck yeah, well, th- thank thank you for saying that. And uh, again, you know, my my, my takeaway from this: do, do you agree with me that what 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 I am seeing with the reaction with uh, I mean, and, and I and I cut just use the word panic. I I, it, I leave the word anxiety behind. That this is a snapshot into the future, you know, when more and more of these things that are now, quote, long-term threats start showing up in real-time, real life, like coronavirus is, 
that we're, we're just going to have a planet in a perpetual state of fear. It's mm-hmm. only going to get worse. Do you agree with that? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I certainly agree that there are a lot of these fears and even one might speak of horror and dread that people uh, have sort of managed to keep beneath the surface or at least half beneath the surface and then the, this crisis uh, raises them, them up uh, and so there's so to say even more gravity because of people's half conscious or unconscious uh, conscious knowledge uh, of the totality of the crisis in which we live uh, yeah, I, I, okay so we have uh, we have try to keep away from the the limit limit the media <clears throat> to 30 minutes a day. Uh, good 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 luck good luck on that. I mean, I mean short of uh, you know moving into a cave, uh, <laughs> you, you, you can't get away from it. Okay, any uh, okay. So we've got that piece of advice. What, what, what's next on your, on your checkoff list of uh, how to uh, calm yourself down from the... Remember, we're talking about the, act, the actual physical threat to your health right now. Mm. Mm. Um, of course, doing what you reasonably can uh, helps a lot also psychologically. That gives you a you know, relative sense of... Uh, if not safety, then at least the feeling that you have done done things uh, to be more more safe. So you know, practicing social distancing and washing your hands and all that stuff that also helps psychologically. Then spending spending time in nature, if possible, that that also also helps. Many people use different mental techniques. Mindfulness might be the most popular of these, but there's all sorts of sorts of vari- variations of that. Do, doing something embodied uh, hel- helps a lot. So that's that's been one important part of my my work in trying to uh, gradually think more and more about our bodily connection with, with these global problems and their local mani- manifestations. So. Uh, what I do with my kids, for example, they are four and six years old at the, at the moment, is that uh, a couple of times a day we, we do some, you know, uh, v- wrestling with no no actual sport intent, but just having having a good, joyful, embodied contact with your close ones, if you have those. Luckily, this can include also non, non-human or others. Yeah, ha- hanging out with your dog, that's what I'm doing. Well, well, well <clears throat> let's, let's talk about the, the, the social distancing and the isolation. Okay, I, I am totally alone in my life. You're, uh, I, I have no uh, wife, no girlfriend. I mean, other than my dog, a, a, you know, I mean, I have almost no social contact out of, outside of what I, what I do on YouTube. I mean... Talk talk about dealing with the uh, the the psychological depression of 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 isolation uh, and how to you know what, what what's your advice? I mean, don't you see that all of this social distancing and isolation and uh, not being able to hug your own friends, and you know what I'm saying, isn't that going to start taking a serious psychological toll pretty quickly? Uh, I completely agree with you on, on that. And, and as, the, uh, as the restrictions continue, I think we will see more and more of these very negative consequences of, of social distancing and I- isolation. And that, that sort of shows that um, even though uh, technical means of having contact with people, that's better than nothing. But of course, we as embodied creatures, we long for something more than just uh, just talking over over technological devices. 
So where, what, what's the answer to it? I mean, how long is how long is this going to go on for? And, and, and I mean, what's going to be the ultimate uh, if these lockdowns just, just keep going indefinitely and we're being uh, separated from each other? And uh, where where could this end? Mm. Uh, that's a very good question. I don't have a have a a complete answer for that naturally. Uh, of course, the pressure uh, to remove many of the restrictions will continue to grow. And now when, when the first, uh, first shock will, will be all over, uh, and that, uh, that brings on one hand some relief because the restrictions won't last forever. On the other hand, there's going to be all kinds of trouble uh, when people start moving again and most probably we will see obligatory uh, ma- masks uh, uh, and, and that, that sort, of, sort of thing happening. So it will be interesting to follow, this is sort of mild way to put it, there will be lots of, lots of tragedies also, but on, on the other hand, uh, a certain kind of relief uh, is that these restrictions won't, won't last, last forever. Okay, so let's go move from the, the the personal physical threat that all of us are dealing with. Now, I, I'm I'm glad to say, at least just speaking for myself, I have zero zero anxiety about getting this thing, much less dying from it. I am completely anxiety free of that. I am I am so happy that, uh, I mean, it, it, it just does not exist in me. So I'm very happy to be able to, to tell you that, Panu. But the, the next piece, and, and this is the economic fallout of this, where what I am uh, most freaked out about, particularly since I am trying to sell a house uh, in the global real estate market right now where every bit of my future I have predicated on selling this house which is now unsellable. Uh, the, the economic effects uh, as more and more healthy people uh, who, who really weren't that concerned about it and uh, just realizing that for the vast, vast majority of us if we show any symptoms at all, it, it's gonna, we're going to have a cough for a couple of weeks and we're going to recover and it's just going to be one more thing uh, that, that, that we have to shrug off. But this economic uh, impacts of this, uh, you know, 16 million Americans out of work now. And, uh, just, just, you know, the threat, a lot of people, I mean, look, look at sub-Saharan Africa, they're starving. I mean, it's, it's from being out of work, freaking out while you're paying your rent, your mortgage, your groceries, uh, that whole thing. Uh, address, the, address the economic uh, kickback, uh, the, the psychological kickback to the economic collapse. And what is your, uh, how are you reading that? And what is your advice to people more freaked out about the economic repercussions than the actual biological ones? Mm. Yeah, that's a very crucial question. And, and what is very much needed in these difficult times is, uh, is, is com- compassion both for oneself and for others, and that's, of course, a lot more easily said, said than done. Uh, but that's, that's a very, very crucial, crucial point, point, I think. And uh, all, all the communities uh, that still, still function, they are going to be very highly valued in, in the times, times that are now un, unfolding, because uh, also my estimation is that the economic trouble is, is not going not gonna to end, end, end anytime, anytime soon and it's most, most probable that we are seeing the first phases of a, of a very, very new kind of, kind of period. And, and of, of course there's been a lot of thinking about 
these kind of possible developments before and uh, as part of the discussions in this channel I'm sure that you have been touching upon this this topic many many times be before so so it's also a curious feeling for many people to to actually see it happening something that has been just thought, thought about for so long a time oh yeah it's uh, it, 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 this is the most data uh, that I and, and you I mean that we're there we're seeing in real time but I mean, I'm, I'm not hearing a whole lot from you, Pando. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what I'm expecting you to be able to do for my own level of freakout. I mean, what, what can anybody say to somebody uh, who's trying to sell their house in a, you know, in a global economic collapse? Uh, just, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know what I'm looking for from you, but... Uh, Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I understand that very, very, very well, and there are many situations where one can si- simply say that I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for the situation in in, in which you, which you are, and and of course, uh, com- compassion would be also a lot, lot easier if people could physically meet meet each each, each other. But do, do you think this is the trigger? Of where where we're certainly just going to have to begin to think about new ways of uh, of, of running a a global economy. That uh, there's going to be. Do you agree that this is not going to be the last economic shock of the 21st century? That if it, that if it wasn't coronavirus, that something else. Was coming along that we were going to have to uh, face up to. Mm, yeah, I definitely agree with you on on, on that one completely. That there that there's more of these that there's more of these coming down down the line. Uh, yeah, and uh, of course one can see them as you know bundled together uh, as phases of one larger and many-faced crises, so that may well be the case that it, it becomes more difficult to see where one particular crisis, like the corona crisis, ends and where the next next one did, did begin. Yeah. Okay, well let's use this as our segue uh, in, 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 into the next phase uh, of, of this conversation, which was going to be my uh, original conversation, so let's take it I, I mean, the, 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 the coronavirus thing, nobody can uh, escape, if, if, you, if you even can escape on one end like I do on the, on the physical threat, you're, you're going to be freaked out on some level, on the economic one, it, you know, if it's not the frying pan, it's in the fire. But let's talk about these, what the main body of your work focuses on. And this is trying to adapt psychologically to a, a long-term unfolding threat that's not uh, on the media 24-7 uh, in your face. You know what I'm saying, that uh, just this looming catastrophe that more and more of us realize is out there. It's getting closer and it's going to be a whole lot bigger than coronavirus when it gets here. Just, just tell us, uh, just, just give us a little bit about what your research is, uh, is leading you to, how to analyze the, the psychological effects of all this. Just, just give us a climate anxiety 101 <laughs> and then tell us what we're going to do about it. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, thanks for uh, asking. Um, I did this report about climate anxiety for the Finnish Mental Health Society, and that's been translated into English and available online. So some of the things that I can't uh, tell tell here will be will be in that 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 document. So on on one hand, anxiety is a good word for what we are facing because. Uh, there are many kinds of anxiety, 
it's closely related with un uncertainty and, and like you said because we can't physically notice all the relevant things related to the ecological crisis and the climate crisis there tends to be a fair amount of uncertainty and our minds have great problems in dealing with that and then these reactions it's a psychosocial combination of psychological and social factors. These have been really one of the key areas of my study. So, so what I do is I, I try to read uh, thoughts and studies from very, very different fields and then form a, a some kind of um, comprehensive view about what, what might be going, going on. So it's clear that there's, there's a lot of so-called socially constructive silence, which means that there are things which practically everybody knows about, but no one speaks about, because they are in one way or, not, or another too difficult for the community. And, and before the end of the 2010s, the, this was the prevailing reaction in relation to the climate crisis and the ecological crisis in most parts of the world. So there was lots of, you know, shooting the messenger type of reactions when somebody tried to raise up the concern, then the, then the group quite instinctively tried to get rid of the troubling issue by silencing the messenger. So, so that was what, what happened, happened a lot. And then there's all kinds of varieties of ways of distancing and, and sometimes de denial even. So this phenomenon of knowing and not knowing at the same time, I think this is very crucial in, re in relation to people's reactions to the ecological crisis and climate crisis. And people can get quite far by practicing distancing and denial, uh, but usually people can't uh, trick themselves totally. And that's what gives a more uh, force to the anxiety. And, and that's also an explaining factor on why the climate denialists, for example, often get so angry when denying their position because there's actually anxiety underneath and they try to keep that anxiety hidden also from themselves. And when somebody confronts that, uh, typical reaction is to get ang angry and do some, some defense of that, of that kind. So these psychosocial dynamics related to silence and distancing and denial are quite, quite crucial for my work. The second part is related to the various forms and emotions that this phenomena raises. So not just anxiety, but also grief, guilt, shame even, that's a very tricky, tricky one, anger, frustration, feelings of helplessness. So there are all kind of shades in this phenomenon. But then, of course, uh, when speaking about people's rela relation to the environment and to other people and creatures, we also have the more easily empowering uh, side of emotions. For example, that sense of connectedness that you can have uh, when, when you are with others or in natural environments, a growing sense of meaning, even, even you know, a sort of growing sense of radical joy if you are lucky enough uh, to, to get enough psychological and social resources to build up your resilience so that you can encounter the more dark emotions so that can also uh, over time give more possibilities for feeling more joy again for example so this kind of methods of coping uh, practicing hope whatever that is for, for people this dimension has also been important for me. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in, in your in, in this long paper that you can find online, guys. That uh, Pane wrote in uh, in the fall of last year. You mentioned this term radical hope, which some people down here uh, in, in, in what I call the, the doomosphere rabbit hole derisively term apocaloptimism. Define radical hope and how we are supposed to find, uh, find hope in this increasingly uh, hopeless future that we're, that we're heading into. Yeah, that's a, that's a good and crucial one. 
So to, to start with, um, most people who write about hope make some distinction between so-called bad forms of hoping and good or desirable forms of hoping. And definitely wishful thinking is not what uh, not what should be pursued, but we need something more more re realistic. And ra radical hope uh, is most famously uh, captured by Jonathan Lear, uh, although I know that some of my uh, North American Indian friends are quite critical of his treatment of North American Indians, but still the concept of radical hope can be separated from that. So it means the ability to hope, even though you cannot know what might actually uh, cause the conditions in which the hope would be fulfilled. Uh, but in my, in my own, own work and li life, I have greatly emphasized that kind of definition of hope, which is very closely connected with a sense of meaningfulness. And the, the late uh, president of Czechoslovakia and the playwright of Absurd Theater, Vaclav Havel, has some great quotations about this kind of hope. There is not the, not the conviction that everything will, will work out fine, uh, but a, a deep uh, se sense of meaning in the efforts, nevertheless to paraphrase how I was quoting in my own, own words. So it's this kind of hope that I'm really, really looking, looking after. And philosophically speaking, one might say that, you know, meaningfulness might be a more exact term for this. But because hope is such a crucial word and thing for people, I have still kept the hope language, even though I know that many people like Derek Jensen, for example, who has been interviewed here, uh, are critical of the word hope, especially because it can, can be also used wrongly. So how do you practice uh, radical hope in, in your own life and uh, achieving uh, meaningfulness? I, li I like that word, meaningfulness. How, how do you try to culture that in your own, uh, in, in your own spiritual practices? Mm. Well, I think, you know, the old wisdom of car carpe diem, memento mori, and that, that stuff, you know, valuing the everyday uh, because of the knowledge that everything is uh, transitory in, in the end. So I think that's closely connected to this meaning, meaningfulness thing that one, one has to try uh, to uphold and live through that meaning in one's everyday life. So sometimes it's in the form of, of work or creative eff efforts Sometimes it's just spending time uh, with, with other, other people or, or creatures. And I don't want to give the impression that it's, you know, all, 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 all sweet when you reach a certain, certain level. That's not, not, the, not the case here, but there's going to be trouble, uh, trouble for ev everyone in the long run. But uh, personally, I can also, also testify that it's, it's possible uh, to grow in... So this kind of emotional skills or emotional resiliency. Uh, I also uh, emphasize the concept of so-called existential resilience, which means the ability to deal enough with these very ancient and troubling existential questions in, in times, times like these. So there's no, no easy, easy, easy answer, where, but these kind of things are what I practice in my daily life also. Okay, I need to, uh, to uh, not, not a real smooth segue, but let's, uh, I want to get into this whole notion that, that you write about quite a bit in your work, uh, and this is the whole notion of individual choices and actions that one uh, makes in their life that and what I particularly want to talk about is, is more and more people and I'm one of these uh, Pandu I'm, I'm, I'm going to admit that have just reached the conclusion that individual actions that we make that you know consumer and lifestyle choices at this point with the level of the, the tsunami of stuff coming towards us in the 21st century 
are, are, are just a joke, that there's nothing we can do as individuals uh, to make any difference. Do you, what, what do you tell people like me who say that? Mm. Well, first of all, I, I very much understand that. And uh, I've liked many things in the ideology of this Extinction Rebellion movement, which has been big in Great Britain. There's a quite lively chapter of that in Helsinki, Finland, on also they, they have this fundamental value where they say that because we live in a toxic system, individuals uh, shouldn't um, feel overburdened by individual re- responsibility. So uh, the, the official formulation can be found in the Extinction Rebellion web- website. So part of the psychological and psychosocial problems related to these things uh, is a sort of psychological defense where we uh, try to believe that our consumer actions have more importance than what they actually do. And this is a very tricky subject in environmental education, for example, because for kids, this is something that they really, really need. They need something that they can and feel that they can do, that gives them a sense of self-efficacy. But on the other hand, I, I've tried to caution about uh, tricking the kids or lying to them about the actual Im- impacts. So, and the, this is a tricky, tricky point, but I think we need really, re- really need more awareness that the problems are so structural uh, that we should act, act together in the midst of these cir- circumstances and n- not in any way overemphasize uh, the in- individual uh, lifestyle or consum- consumer choices. So uh, I'm, I'm almost hearing you uh, agree with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah one, could, one could say so, say so but uh, of course I, I want to uh, cling on to this mean- meaningfulness thing so also for some people, if, if you say to them directly that, you know, this doesn't have any, any significance, uh, if, if that takes away totally their, you know, sense of meaningfulness, that might not be very psychologically wise either. So if you want to sort of ed- educate people into a more, more lasting approach towards life, just saying things bluntly, sometimes isn't the most reasonable thing to do. Sometimes it may be. Life is complex. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably uh, accused of saying things too bluntly. So, sp- speaking of which, uh, uh, okay, Panu, you, you seem like a, a man who doesn't mind speaking honestly. So, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to uh, to get. I, I, I do not come on here, and I, and I do not want you to read this that I am debating you. I just know that I personally am really interested in the answer to this question, and I know that a lot of people are. At any point that you feel uncomfortable and you tell me that you don't want to continue this discussion, I will respect that. But I have never gone here with one of my guests in two years interviewing over 100 people. I have never had the discussion I'm getting ready to have with you. So uh, if you feel like you're being ambushed at any point... Say I don't I, I don't want to have this discussion anymore, and that's fine, and we'll change it. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Here, here goes. Uh, clearly, Panu, you you understand. It's obvious to anyone listening to you that that you understand where we're heading to in the twenty first century. Uh, that that there's going to be things a lot worse than coronavirus coming down the pike in, in the fairly near future. Uh, and you also, sounds like you somewhat understand the futility of individual and, and lifestyle choices. So I, I know that you, you said you have two children, age four and six. Okay. Mm-hmm. I know you have seen that famous graph. I, I, I've seen it 
uh, charted in many ways. I really like the way the Guardian uh, put this. What they did is they showed the solar system with the sun and the nine planets going around. And so what they do, and this has been charted many different ways, what the, what the Guardian did is they took the top ten consumer and lifestyle choices that you can make in the face of the impending uh, environmental catastrophes heading our way. You, you take nine of them, like the planets, you, you, you know, in size from Mercury or Pluto up to Jupiter. You take, I, I can't remember them, but they're the usual. Uh, recycling, vegan lifestyle, not having a car, not flying, using solar panels, and there's four more. You take them, you add them all together, uh, two through ten, you add them all together and they do not add up to the number one and only consumer and lifestyle choice you make. And plenty of people I've interviewed have, have made this quite clear, and that is to have one less child. I, I, I know you're aware of, of, of the are, well, let me ask you, I don't know. I mean, are you aware of this research saying that having one less child is hands down the most important uh, consumer and lifestyle choice you can make in the 21st mm -hmm. century? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, and, so you, you, you know this, and yet you and your wife have chosen now to have two children in the face of all of this mounting evidence and it's just like when Bill Moyers was talking to Chris Hedges uh, about his choice, I guess Chris has had three children now, that if you truly understand where we are heading in the 21st century, why did you make the choice to uh, to bring two more children onto the planet. Mm. Yeah, that, that's also a very crucial question, and uh, I'm okay with talking talking about that. So uh, there's plenty plenty here. Uh, first of all, uh, when we had the first one, I wasn't as aware uh, of the collapse as I am now. So things were were a bit different different back then also. But then again, I also think that uh, there are some things uh, in the human life and for the human tribe that are beyond just mathematical calculation of environmental impacts, for, for example. There are some, some things related to fundamentals of life uh, and the life of the human tribe, I'm speaking a bit symbolically here, but not in all, all cases, that are, are different. So, and any, anyway, we have to try to live uh, together in, in the circumstances that we end up. And then one possible way of, way of thinking is to emphasize that we need uh, also individuals uh, who can practice compassion and try to build various kinds of resilience in the midst of these circumstances. And that, I think, is the educational task of our times. Uh, but I don't want, want to say that this is ethically the only right, right solution. I completely respect other people's cho choices here, uh, and the issue is very complicated. Uh, 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 okay, so obviously you and your you and your wife d d d d discussed all the uh, all the implications of this, and uh, you d d d decided that the decision to 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 have children. Uh, well, well, did, did, I don't want to use the word outweigh. But would you say balanced out your concerns on the uh, on the on the side of the ledger of reasons not to have children? Yeah, one could say so. That is right. That that would be that that that, that would be one way of describing it. Yeah, I just know you're 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 speaking to a tough crowd here, Pandu. <laughs> 
and uh, and I really appreciate you uh, having that having that uh, discussion with us because we really I, I mean they're, they're, I, I really do want to understand. Now, see, I, I do not have any children, so I, I just think there's this gulf between people who don't have children and, and people who do that we need to figure out how to communicate with each other. But I see, uh, unbelievably, uh, all three of the cameras are still going, but two of them are screaming and we're getting ready to collapse here. So as I do uh, with all of my guests, uh, if you are not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles where you had all of this free time but you actually had the mainstream media with a camera in front of you saying um, Panu Pikala uh, you have 60 seconds to bring your message to the planet uh, in the spring of 2020 what would that 60 second sound bite sound like? Um, yeah that's a tough, tough one for a Finn who is living late late evening now and the sun has set, but let's let, let's let's try try and start. So we live in a time where there's plenty of of anxiety, even panic, lots of distress. The world is changing. We can see it ar- around us, uh, and now more th- more than ever we need the wisdom to stop, uh, slow down, and try to find those resources that enable us to be our best selves. We have in us the ability to panic, the ability to build boundaries between in-groups and out-groups and so on, but we also have the ability to practice compassion and empathy and to be creative, try to find ways to live together amidst uh, very changing circumstances. This is what we see now with the coronavirus is only the beginning of a very long series of events. It has many ecological sides and many social sides. And more than ever, we need uh, recovery of the very best uh, human aspects that we can bring into focus. Okay, and with that, uh, guys, let's st- stick around after we hang up. But uh, it's... Guys, uh, if you enjoyed what Panu had to share with us, please spend a few seconds to thumb up this video and do subscribe when you're over here. But right now, before these uh, sick cameras collapse on me, uh, I do appreciate you folks tuning in. And Panu Pikala, we really appreciate the time you have spent with us. And more importantly, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Bye, guys.